everybody. Welcome back to the living room. Thank you all for being here on this hot September evening. I feel like we've been saying that month after month, and we keep promising you that we're going to fix the air conditioning, and clearly we haven't. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, there are some new faces in the room. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, uh, some of those new faces are sitting in the periphery of the room, so hopefully um, this introduction to this, this forum and this space uh, next month, we'll have you sitting up on the couches a little closer to us. Uh, we're going to start tonight, as usual, with our Around the Room, uh, just so we can give uh, Dr. David, who you, we've all been emailing, uh, or we've been emailing all of you incessantly about, um, um, an idea of who's sitting here and who maybe has had surgery, who hasn't and wants to know why they can't. Um, it's going to be a, a really exciting conversation. As you guys know, um, Dr. David comes to us uh, from UC Davis. Uh, she's thoracic surgeon extraordinaire up there, and we're very, very happy to have her. Um, so we're going to oh, – Tina, you're not sitting in my first, my first position this month. <laughs> um, before we start the Around the Room, welcome to everybody who's uh, signed in online. Thank you very much. Um, push out your questions. Andrea is over there monitoring, um, and she'll make sure she gets uh, your questions to me uh, as soon as you type them in. Thank you guys for joining, too. Um, Emily's all the way up from L.A., so I don't know if you want to start. Oh, and for the new people in the room um, – if you do want to uh, to talk or introduce yourself, just make sure uh, you use a microphone so that the lovely people signing in from home can hear what you're uh, saying. So, Em. Who do I look at? Just everybody. <laughs> I'm Emily. I'm a um, stage four adenocarcinoma um, survivor. Um, I was diagnosed at 28 with... Um, a tumor in my right upper lobe and spread to the pleura, and I had eight rounds of carboplatin, Olympta, and Avastin, and I'm sorry, six rounds of all three of those, and then two more of Olympta and Avastin, and then a year and a half ago, I um, had surgery to remove my right lung and the lining and the lymph nodes and part of the diaphragm and part of the pericardium sac around my heart, and then a month later started radiation and had 28 rounds of that. And I have been no evidence of disease or NED for a little over a year and a half now. So I, I now work with the foundation as a spokesperson um, and a patient advocate. And I'm just really happy to be here in town for the week. So. You, you all have seen Emben a time or two in some of our, <laughs> some of our promotional materials. I'm Michelle Taylor, and I'm Emben's mother-in-law, and was very active in um, her as a caretaker in her treatment. And this subject is really um, an important one for us because we felt from the very beginning that we were looking for the possibility for a, a full life for her, and we felt that surgery. Um, was a, a piece of that puzzle. It needed to be to be part of her treatment, and we started very early on and inter visited many many surgeons and were relentless until somebody said yes and and feel very strongly that it's um, the reason that we're here today and planning the future of of, of our family. Hi, I'm uh, Hank Herringsman. I'm a research associate with Clovis Oncology. Hi, I'm Doug Lipinski, and I was diagnosed on July 9th with uh, stage 4 adenocarcinoma. And I started on Tarsiva shortly after that, and it's working wonderfully. Um, there's somebody I need to go hug at Genentech. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Beth Bagley. I work in the lung division at Marriott Genetics. Hi, I'm Evie Schiffman, and my better half, Neil, is here. He will talk in a couple of minutes, and I'm the caregiver, although I must say he takes very good care of himself. He's very independent, so I have an easy go as a caregiver, but I am the caregiver. I'm Danny Gasparini. I'm part of the uh, development team here at the Adario Lung Cancer Foundation. Very proud to be. Oh, sorry. I'm Sally. Um, I was
was proactive and put myself into an early lung cancer study, an international one. And after five years, found out I had lung cancer. So I was able to have my lower right lobe removed. And it had not spread anywhere else. So I'm a big advocate of early detection and being proactive if you're high risk. Um, I'm Tina, and I'm I'm here with my husband Rick, but he doesn't want to say anything. That's okay. Um, I was diagnosed in November of 2010, and I went through radiation and chemotherapy, and I did test positive for EGFR, and I've been on uh, Tarceva for three three years now, and um, have had clean scans since. So I feel very fortunate. Thank you. Hi, I'm Neil. I was diagnosed a little over three years ago with uh, lung cancer. And as I always say, I was told that I was stage four, but I like to say that I'm stage five because you always have to be one better than everybody else in whatever you do. Um, looking forward to the presentation tonight because the two questions that I get from friends and a lot of other people always are, or if I'm doing presentations, first, did you smoke? And I love that question because the answer is no, I never even tried it, but it doesn't make any difference whether I did or not. And secondly, why can't they just cut it out of you? So that's what I'll be listening for tonight. And it's great to see Emily here tonight. And it's unfortunate that she lives 400, 500 miles away because I'd love to have her here all the time. Uh, you know, she is online, yeah, I know, but there's nothing like the real thing. And so many of us, you know, watch daily about the news when you had your surgery and then you got up and you're walking around the hospital doing the best that you possibly could and, and you became heroes to so many of us uh, coming from where you were and seeing where you are now is like a phenomenal thing, you know, for me to see. So I'm glad that you're here, and I know you'll be doing the walk, and I heard that your times have been getting better and better. <laughs> and as a one-lung person, it's like, this is unbelievable. I know we, we need to have a special type of Olympics for you. <clears throat> but my treatments consisted, like with Doug, I did Tarceva, and I would say, yes, we should say thank you to the people at Genentech, but let's say thank you for all the people who were on the clinical trial, who opted in, and some of them didn't do as well as others, but because of that, we got to have that great drug. And some of us are still taking it, others washed out like me after 13 months. And then I went to IV chemo, and I know most of you have had that. That's not my first or even my 50th choice to have, so I was happy when a clinical trial came up for me and Hank happens to work for the company Clovis Oncology, which is doing great work in that field. And I was on that trial for about a year, but like everything else, all the good things have to end, it seems. So that meant a change for me, and now doing a, a regimen of a fatinib and cetuximab, so an oral drug daily, along with the needle every other week. But I think uh, that good thing will end soon also. So I'm looking forward to an immunology uh, trial in the near future, so time will tell. But I'll give you a good report about that. Hello, my name is Nita, and I've, I've been doing this thing for a long time. Uh, and I also was on uh, Darceva for quite a while, and am still, in a way, uh, shoulder to shoulder with people taking Darceva because now um, the situation with me is that the lung cancer has spread to my brain, and uh, it's a very unusual kind of brain thing. And uh, so what we're trying to do right now is we're taking 10 pills of Tarceva uh, one day a week, not rather than one day, one day a week, one pill. And it's, it's kind of trying, but uh, it does seem to be working somewhat. It's uh, 
not spreading to the brain as fast as everyone said. Everyone said, well, you'll be finished with the whole thing in no time flat. Well, it's still the type of brain cancer I have now is, um, it's not getting better, it's not getting worse. It's just being stable is what my doctor says. So that's what I have to say. Anybody in the back want to say anything? Fred? No? Okay, great. Anybody else? No. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, we are going to turn things over to Dr. David. Um, and I, I think I told you a little a bit about what we're going to talk about, and I'm happy to hear that um, some people have some questions in um, in the room about who surgery is right for and who it isn't. And to Neil's point, how do you answer that question when people ask you, right? Um, so I think one of the things we're going to touch on tonight a little bit is about how you communicate with your physician um, uh, to best get the answers, whoa, is that me? To suit, to suit your needs. So I, I want to start um, with Dr. David by asking her, first of all, what made her decide to go into thoracic surgery? Sure. So... Um, I'm one of those people who always wanted to be a doctor. Um, I never really thought about doing much else. Um, and so I went to medical school and my plan was to become a pediatrician. And I did my surgical rotations and very quickly realized that it was a really good fit for me and my personality. Um, Despite the fact that I wasn't a morning person, I actually enjoyed getting out of bed at four o'clock in the morning and had energy. And I loved the idea that you know by nine o'clock you had accomplished a ton, way more than most people had <laughs> in the whole day. Um, so I, you know, I fell in love with surgery, and then it was a longer process to figure out that I was going to become a thoracic surgeon. Um, but I decided about three years into my surgical training that I loved the, op the challenge of operating in the chest. Um, as a surgeon who operates on the heart or lungs, you deal with operating in a hole because the chest cavity doesn't collapse when we operate. So we operate between ribs or through the sternum, depending on what we're doing. And um, our targets are moving. So as a surgeon, that's an added challenge. Um, and I enjoyed those challenges. So for me, I knew the anatomy really pulled me in. And then I also knew that I wanted to have a long-term relationship with my patients. And as a surgeon, the, really, the only way that you can have that long-term relationship is by taking care of patients with cancer because most patients, uh, most surgeons who operate on cancer patients will follow those patients for many years after the operations. So, um, you know, I I'm, I'm have the privilege of seeing patients for several years, usually about five years after we operate for cancer, which was very important to me. So um, that's sort of how I ended up where I am now, and it was definitely the right decision for me. I can't imagine doing anything else. So, so before we go into um, you know detailed conversation about surgery, I wanted to ask you, and this is something I don't think we've ever really asked any of our doctors, at least not live, um, about how you feel about support groups, and in particular a group like this. Um, where it's not just patients, you know, connecting with one another, but getting access to to this 
great educational aspect of it. Right. So um, when I was doing my, so for to become a thoracic surgeon, you go to medical school, you do a surgery residency, and then you do additional specialty training called a fellowship. So when I was doing my fellowship training, uh, one of my surgical mentors had actually started a support group for patients that she had done a particular operation for. And as the trainee on the service, you would go to the support group. And I'm thinking, oh man, you know, this is at the end of the day. It makes my day even longer. You know, why in the world do I need to go to this? This is between her and her patients. You know, I don't, I'm just gonna be an imposter. They're gonna feel like I don't belong in the room. So that was sort of the attitude that I went into the situation with. And um, I was completely blown away the first time I went. I, um, you know, the, the surgery that um, she was focused on was esophagectomy. And that is a surgery that really alters people's lifestyle because um, it, it greatly affects the way that you eat. So she would have this, um, you know, in the evening, much similar to this time, and folks would come in and they would have all sorts of complaints or happy things to share, you know, people telling funny stories about things that they had eaten and disasters that had ensued after they'd eaten. And, and I saw what it did for the patients. I saw that the patients were having a great deal of comfort from sitting next to somebody and hearing someone who had gone through something similar to what they were going through. And it's a different comfort than you can provide as a physician. Because like I told Emily, I haven't had a chest tube. I haven't had a chest tube removed. I've never had surgery. So I think I know what it feels like, and academically I know what it should feel like, but I've never actually experienced it. So as a surgeon, as a physician, I learn a lot from a group like this because I learn more of the patient perspective. And I think for patients, this is just such an underutilized resource. You know, I challenge you guys each time you come to bring someone with you. You know, find someone in the infusion center that you haven't met before and invite them. Because this is not on everyone's radar. And I think that it, it really helps. You know, I think we're, we've gotten very good about social media and online communities, but there's something to be said for the face-to-face -face community interaction. So. So keep up the good work. Thanks, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about surgery. I think um, for purposes of flow, maybe if we start with screening and early detection and surgery for, for that subset of patients, and then we'll move into uh, some of the later, later sure. stages. So um, I think we had one early stage patient in the room? Yeah, so as you guys may or may not know, you know, the majority of lung cancer is not diagnosed in the early stage. And hopefully with advances in screening, that is something that will change in a relatively short period of time. Um, but that, that also is something that needs a lot of advocacy. Um, Mammography, colonoscopy, PSA screening, it's really high on people's radar, but lung cancer screening is not. And so again, you know, you can, you can help your doctors by asking, say, do you ask your patients? You know, on my last well woman exam, I was asked about breast cancer risks and, um, and colon cancer risk, but she didn't ask me about, for, about lung cancer. And so I said, hey, you know, are you talking to your patients about this? So, you know, that's certainly an area that we are making rapid strides in, and I think the National Lung Screening Trial is helping. Um, and certainly when the Center for, Centers for um, Medicare decide, make their decision about payment, I think that will help a lot in terms of screening. So, 
surgery right now um, is one of the treatment modalities that we reserve for what we call curative intent, okay? Meaning we offer operations to patients where we plan to resect all known sites of disease. And I think that um, at this point, that's the standard of care, and there may be some changes to that in my lifetime. Um, and, and where that comes into play is that I think we are getting better with um, our medical therapies, meaning the chemotherapy, at controlling sites of disease so that we may be able to render more patients totally disease free in all areas except one, their primary tumor, et cetera. So that's, that's gonna be an area in the future. But for right now, standard of care for early stage disease is resection. And for people who can't tolerate resection, then they're offered radiotherapy. So, and then when we talk about what, what does that operation entail? Well, that's gonna be a lobectomy if you can tolerate a lobectomy, or if your tumor uh, necessitates it, it may be more than a lobectomy. So depending on where your tumor is, you may need two lobes taken out, you may need your whole lung taken out, you may need your lung and other things taken out, uh, chest wall, diaphragm, heart sac lining, all of those are individual decisions made based on the tumor. Um, then we have the decision of do we do this, how do we do the operation? Do we do an operation with small incisions and a video camera? Do we do it with small incisions and a surgical robot? Or do we do it with an incision behind the shoulder blade? Um, kind of the old fashioned way. And all of those decisions are made for the patient and the tumor, and they're all individual decisions. And there's really not, in terms of that decision, there's really not one right or wrong answer in terms of the approach. And again, that'll be sort of a very individual decision that's made. So, so you, you talked a little bit about maybe resection um, versus radiation even on a, um, an early stage patient. So how is, how is that determined? You know, who are you going to do surgery on versus maybe somebody, even though they have early stage, doesn't, doesn't qualify for surgery? Right. So, you know, all of these treatment decisions, and I think, um, I really hope you all hear me say this, regardless of your stage of disease, each patient is different. And each patient is going to get a personalized treatment plan. And you know, not all stage four disease is the same, not all stage three A disease is the same, not three B is the same, and each stage one is, is different. You know, there are people with stage one lung cancer who need a pneumonectomy because their very small tumor happens to be in a bad place and requires the whole lung to be taken out. So the decision for surgery versus radiation is typically based on a patient's, number one, their tumor, but also the other things uh, about the patient. Their other medical problems, uh, their functional status, what else is going on you know, in their life, and sort of their ability to participate in the recovery from surgery. Um, both surgery and radiation are considered local treatments, meaning they work on the area to which they're applied. So if I take out a certain area of the lung, that's treating that particular area. It's not doing anything to the remainder of the lung or the other lymph nodes in the chest. And radiation is the same way. Radiation only works on the parts of the lungs to which it's applied. So some reasons that we may choose to offer a patient radiation versus surgery would be um, patients whose lung function is not at a point at which they can tolerate any removal of lung. People um, you know, 
who have bad emphysema already or who are on oxygen, they may not tolerate us taking out any more, any more lung. Now, some of those patients will actually get better if we take out some of their bad lung because it will give them more room for a good lung. So even that is a very individualized decision that needs to be made. Um, patients you know, who have a lot of heart disease, they may not be able to tolerate having surgery. Having chest surgery requires general anesthesia. It requires that during the operation, you're only breathing with one of your lungs. So your lungs and your heart have to be able to tolerate that. And if there are certain medical factors that exist that may inhibit the patient's ability to tolerate that altered physiologic state. So it's a very, very individualized decision. And it's, it's not a black and white thing at all about who gets surgery and who gets radiation for early stage disease. So staying on early stage for a little bit, um, and I know Sally, you know, being the one in the room who, uh, who's had surgery because hers was caught early, how do you determine right now who, um, who qualifies either for um, neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy? How do you, deter how do you determine that? Um, and um, what kind of follow-up post-surgery? Sure. So right now, um, chemotherapy is not recommended for patients who have no evidence of disease outside of their lung tumor, okay? So if we have an early stage patient with just a small lung tumor, that patient is gonna be treated first with either surgery or radiation. So there would be no neoadjuvant chemotherapy in that setting. Neoadjuvant therapy right now is going to be recommended for patients with stage 3 disease or higher. So if you have a patient with a lung mass and um, a mediastinal lymph node, that person is probably going to get chemotherapy and radiation. And if they're a, a good candidate, that would probably be followed by surgery. If um, if that therapy has really been a lot for that person to get through, you may wait um, on the resection until a later time. So you may treat initially with chemotherapy and radiation and then reevaluate for surgery after the completion. But that treatment modality um, in terms of neoadjuvant in that setting, that's something that's usually done in a multidisciplinary fashion meaning in a setting where thoracic surgeons, medical oncologists, and radiation oncologists are working together and discussing the cases together. And everybody has seen the patient before they start their therapy, and so everyone has an idea of where we're going and then if we need to alter the plan along the way, why the plan's being altered. So where chemotherapy would come in for early stage patients is when we get that final pathology report back from surgery. So we'd have their surgery and then they get their full lymph node dissection with surgery. And if there's tumor in the mediastinal lymph nodes or in any lymph nodes, then adjuvant chemotherapy is usually recommended in that setting. Um, is there a certain number of lymph nodes that you should pull to determine? I'm sorry. A certain number of mediastinal nodes in particular or nodes in general that you should pull to determine staging? And So that is a very controversial question. Um, the number of nodes uh, depends not only on the surgeon, but it depends on the pathologist and how they look at the nodes and whether or not they take a conglomerate of nodes and call it one or whether they take fragments of nodes and call them individual nodes. It's very subjective. The thing that we know is the importance of sampling all of the areas in the chest. So there are, there's a lymph node map 
that we all use um, that gives us anatomic regions for the lymph nodes. And it is very important that each station, that's what the locations are called, each station be sampled. And that is the key thing. That's, that's where you really have the best staging that you can get, is when you have that pathologic evaluation of all of the different stations. And there may be situations where there aren't lymph nodes in a certain station. And, you know, as a surgeon, you, you do your best to identify all of those stations, and there are certain technical maneuvers that you do to identify tissue that should be lymph node tissue present in those areas. And if you don't find it, then there, it may not be there. But as a surgeon, you need to be looking in all of those areas. Elizabeth, is it a standard of care for surgeons to discuss these things with a patient before surgery? Um, it is standard of care to do mediastinal lymph node dissection. And um, I mention it to all of my patients because one of the common things is I'll say what we're going to do is a lobectomy with mediastinal lymph node dissection. And the women, patients especially, a light goes off, they think, oh my goodness, my chest is gonna swell. Because people know that when you have a lymph node dissection in your armpit with breast cancer, that your arm might swell. So the light goes off and the female patients, oh my goodness, is what's gonna happen if the lymph nodes in my chest are, are manipulated? And the answer is nothing happens. There's very little sequelae. Um, to doing a lymph node dissection, but it is a standard part of the operation. And um, if for some reason you know ahead of time that you're not going to have any lymph nodes sampled, um, it would behoove you to ask why and to ask your doctor. Um, so a couple, you, you guys feel free to ask questions as we're going. I'm going to ask a couple of questions coming from online. Um, with a patient wanting to know um, uh, your views, uh, stage 2B in the left upper lobe uh, with two nodules in the right that are, are being watched uh, but have not changed, scans every three months. Nodules are in the middle right lobe, uh, watch and wait, or lobectomy. Uh, this was two years ago. They're nine millimeters and five millimeters. Like, Does that make sense? <laughs> no. <laughs> so make sense to you. not quite. No. <clears throat> this this patient is stage two B. It sounds like from what I'm reading, and if you're listening and I'm saying this wrong, um, come back. It sounds like there's maybe bilateral lesions because we're talking about the right and we're talking about the left. So two nodules. Yes. That's right. Two nodules, one on the right, one on the left? No, just in the right lobe. Oh, just in the right. Oh, so this was supposed to be an R. So it's right um, upper lobe. There we go, both nodules. <laughs> um, they've had chemo. Nothing has changed. Um, should she watch and wait for them to move or do a lobectomy? This has been two years. And both lesions are in the right upper lobe? Uh, yes. Is that right? And both lesions are in the middle lobe, and they've been stable. And they're they're biopsy proven. Well, she can hear. It may be a little bit dangerous to get super specific. Yeah. Um, if but, somebody had. Yeah, but uh, I think if you know if your disease is stable um, and you haven't been offered surgery. It's the question that you ask is why? Why haven't I been offered surgery? Has my case been discussed in a multidisciplinary tumor board? And has a thoracic surgeon reviewed the images? Because, you know, I am happy to look at a scan at any point and then, you know, investigate the case further. But, the, you know, as a patient, the, the question that you want, you want to ask is, you know, what are the other treatment options? Is, you know, is observation the only option? Or, you know, is consideration for surgery or radiation possible for me? And that, that's where I think you 
you know, you can benefit and advocate for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, don't the nodules need to be a certain size before they're even uh, biopsy? Because I have nodules, and I've been told my largest one is only seven millimeters. And I was told if it ever hits one, then they'll biopsy it, exactly. one centimeter. But anything smaller than that, they don't biopsy. Exactly. And it, it very much depends on the center, and it depends on the ability of the radiologist to biopsy things that are very small. But a lot, most places don't consider biopsy for things that are under one centimeter because that is really tiny. I mean, a, a centimeter is a very, a very small uh, measurement. And so if we're talking about things that are four and seven millimeters, um, you know, those are, those are tiny. And so as a surgeon, that is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Um, and so really our options are quite limited in terms of me trying to do a surgical biopsy on something that, that, that is that small. So you're exactly right that, you know, depending on the situation, it's a little hard to tell from the question, you know, observation would probably be recommended to continue. Dr. David, I have a couple questions for you. First, as the surgeon, do you want the patient to work with his or her team to shrink the mass that you're going to take out as much as possible before you actually do the surgery? So that's the first one. And the second one is, what procedures are you working on now that will be called the David procedure in five years <laughs> that'll be the cutting edge and the new standard of care? So I'll answer the second question first. So fortunately or unfortunately for me, there's a very famous cardiac surgeon from Canada who has, I think he's on his seventh David procedure um, right now. So I've, I've lost the market on that one. Um, but the answer to your first question is um, size doesn't really matter. It's the other, um, the other factors that go into the decision to whether, for whether or not surgery is needed um, or needed first or chemotherapy and radiation would be recommended. So I've taken out very large tumors, 11, 12, 13 centimeter tumors. Now you're not taking that out with a small incision and a video camera because you just can't get a big mass out through a tiny incision. But um, size alone doesn't really play into that equation. The problem with when you get a very large mass is that odds are, unless it's a squamous cell, it's usually going to have spread somewhere else by the time it's that big. So that, that's where the other therapies would come into play. Good. <coughs> so, um we spoke a little bit before, but you know, as a, as a later stage lung cancer patient, so much of, of, of the treatments and everything are, are out of our control. And I think that that's sometimes the hardest part for patients is that none of it is really in our control. What um, maybe advice would you give to someone? So if they're maybe on the borderline between surgery or not surgery, what advice would you give to them to be best prepared for themselves? What can they take? into their own control to be the best candidate for surgery that they can possibly be? So a few things. So I think that as a patient, you want to be the most educated consumer that you can be. And that is the double-edged sword of the internet. Um, you know, there's a lot to read about on the internet and you just need to be careful of the source. Um, you want to use reputable sources. Um, Cancer.gov has a very nice patient-oriented section, um, which is a good place to get factual information. And then, you know, getting information from other patients can be very helpful as well. Um, anecdotal evidence or information from other patients can, can help you. You know, word of mouth, oh, you know, such and such physician, you know, did such and such for me. And 
you may not qualify for the exact same treatment that your friend had, but talking to those physicians or talking to other physicians may open up something else for you because all of these decisions are individual and you know cases are really considered individually and not all treatment is the same. So that's what I would really advocate for is that you know you educate yourself. You fight for yourself. You know, if you don't are not, if you're not happy with what you're hearing, if you're not happy with your interaction with your physician, then as best you're able to, you need to advocate to see someone else. Ask for a second opinion. Any physician who reacts negatively to being asked for a second opinion, that is a red flag. You should definitely seek one at that point if the person is resistant. Um, and I would just say, you know, if, there's, if there are things that you're confused about, keep asking the question until you are no longer confused. It's very helpful to write down your questions before you go to see a doctor. It's so easy when we walk in with our white coats and we seem busy for you to forget everything or we say something that you weren't expecting and then you have an emotional response to what we said and you don't hear anything else. And that happens all the time. It's totally normal. It's a totally human reaction. That's why you know having that buddy or the caregiver with you at an appointment is very important because each person will hear completely different things frequently during the visits. So having another set of ears, recording the appointment, um, you know, most cell phones nowadays can record uh, either audio or visual, you know, to, to actually know what was said in the visit so you can review it at home later. But if you have questions for your doctors, ask them. And keep asking until you no longer have questions. And then um, in terms of folks getting ready to have surgery. So, you know, surgery is a, what we call a physiologic stress. Um, the, <laughs> the actual um, act of having general anesthesia, the act of somebody cutting you with a knife and then taking a part of your body out and then closing you back up, it's a big stressor. So you need to be in good shape to get you through it a little better. What I ask my patients to do is to make sure that they are walking. I ask people to walk for 20 minutes three times a day before they have surgery because that is part of a good recovery from lung surgery. Being able to do that, being able to walk in the hospital with your chest tube is key. So if you can't walk before the operation, you're gonna have serious problems after the operation because you're gonna get pneumonia, you're gonna have other complications that are gonna make surgery even harder to get over. So being cardiovascularly fit, now you don't have to be walking a marathon, but being able to walk for 20 minutes is a must. And you know, eating as healthy as you can it's always a good idea. Um, surgery, the kind of the key component is healing. It's all about wound healing. The incisions have to heal. When we resect parts of the lung, the parts that we don't resect have to heal. So if people have very poor nutrition going into surgery, that's going to affect their ability to heal. Some of the chemotherapy that you guys are taking also impacts your ability to heal. So we have to l let that chemotherapy wash out of your system before we can do operations. And that is an important, um, important, important thing to remember for those people who end up go undergoing surgical biopsies for later stage disease. So. Um, we grab, your, grab your mic, yes, yeah, sorry. Oh. Debbie's hogging all the mics. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, 
When uh, does a stage four uh, patient become a candidate for surgery? So <clears throat> the first thing I will say about that is surgery for stage four disease, everybody needs to be clear on the intent. The patient needs to have the right expectations. <laughs> The surgeon needs to have the right expectations. The medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, everybody needs to be on the same page. So for right now, surgery is not standard of care for stage four disease. The vast majority of surgery that we are doing for stage four disease has to do with biopsy for molecular testing. Do you all know what I mean by that? So some people will need <laughs> a VATS biopsy or um, you know, a, maybe you'll need a pericardial window or a pleural biopsy and we can talk about each of those. So that is the vast majority of surgery right now for stage four disease. Other settings would be for isolated metastases. So people who have a metastasis in one place. So one brain lesion, or an isolated adrenal lesion, or an isolated chest wall lesion, an isolated MET. And that, again, goes back to that point that I made initially, that surgery is a local therapy. So if you have lung cancer that has gone to some other place in your body, we know that you need a treatment that goes to all the places in your body that surgery alone is only gonna treat those, those individual places, but it's not gonna treat the pathway that got it from your lung to your brain or your adrenal gland. So that's where you know, the chemotherapy comes in. So you would never have surgery alone for stage four disease in, in this current era. You would have chemotherapy as well, so. So an, an online question, and I think you just touched on it, um, uh, is would you ever consider a surgical remover of a, uh, a removal of a primary lung tumor in a stage four patient with previous but now controlled brain mets? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we do. We do. Um, There's a question oh, over here. Oh, okay. We need you to grab your mic. Hi, love. You snuck in late. So the same with lymph nodes, right? That if, if, if the chemo has you know, made them virtually impossible to find now, you could still consider surgery of the primary tumor that's in the lung? It, it's gonna depend on how many lymph nodes and where they are. So if you're talking about mediastinal lymph nodes on the same side versus the opposite side, or if you have more than one station of lymph nodes that are affected, it, it's going to be, one, and that, that again is going to be one of those decisions that should be made in a multidisciplinary manner where, you know, you have a surgeon and your medical oncologist and radiation oncologist all working together and say, okay, we have so-and-so who had a lymph node in station seven, which is in the middle of the chest, mm -hmm. and that responded completely to our chemotherapy and radiation, and now all we have left, left is this right upper lobe mass, yes, that's a person who probably would be considered for surgery. And so you'd have surgery, and you'd have your mediastinal lymph node dissection. And if, in fact, the tumor affected the sternum, then you're looking at something like, totally different, right? You are. You are. And you don't look at surgery of the sternum because? Um, in, an, in surgery and the sternum in the patient with lymph nodes? Well, the lymph or nodes. Or is it just, just the lung and the sternum? Well, the lymph nodes are now undetectable, so. So that's a question. Right. And we don't know the right answer to that. So, you know, right now, in the community on your own, it would not be standard to offer surgery to that patient. In an academic center, 
where, you know, again, this multidisciplinary discussion is going to be held, that patient may be considered for surgery. Maybe. Thank you. And, you know, these patients like this, that, you know, that's a classic example of a very individual case by case uh, decision that needs to be made. Um, and we were talking earlier, for a case like that, you know, surgeons are going to discuss that case with other surgeons. And they'll probably get multiple opinions about what the correct thing is to do for that patient. And there are going to be other factors that go into it. Uh, you know, patient age, patient functionality, et cetera, is going to play a role. So it's, it's one of those things where, you know, I would say make sure you are discussed in a, a multidisciplinary setting and keep asking, you know, if you're, if you're not happy with the answers that you're getting. And there's a big difference between a general surgeon in a <coughs> community center and a thoracic surgeon that's, that's trained to operate in the thoracic area only. So Big I difference. mentioned, yes, so, you know, I mentioned my training. Um, I did five years of general surgery, and then I did two years of fellowship training, um, and I'm double boarded. I have board certification from the American Board of Surgery, and I have board certification from the American Board of Thoracic Surgery. And not all people who operate in the chest have both of those things. So if you're in a setting especially where you have advanced di stage disease, you really want to seek treatment from someone who has both of those certifications. Thank you very much. So there's a, a, an online question that's kind of a, a tag onto this. Um, and it, the question is why, right? Why not go beyond standard of care and operate on a stage four patient who could possibly benefit from lower tumor burden, even though you know you're not getting all the disease? So right now, we don't have data that supports us doing that. So we don't have big patient series that show if we reduce the amount of tumor burden that we are prolonging people's lives or decreasing or increasing their disease-free survival. So we, we don't know the answer to that scientifically. Um, but again, this is where you know, the individual situation comes into play, where you know, I think for younger patients, they tend to sort of tug a little more at, at folks and people will tend to sort of do things that are a little outside the box. Um, because it is a younger person, there's sort of more um, life that you want to try to get for them. Doesn't mean that for folks who are older that we don't want any less for you guys, but it's, um, it's sort of an, an easier argument as a surgeon to make, and I think because the younger patients, and Emily, you correct me if I'm wrong, tend to be willing to take that risk. You tend to be, as a younger person, be willing to say, all right, I hear what you're saying that this may really not be indicated, but I'm willing to take the risk of having someone take out my whole lung because I don't really have any other choice. And so, you know, you, you may get, get what you want that way, you know. And as of now, we don't, we don't have the data. We don't have the big numbers to tell us whether or not it makes a difference and whether or not we're hurting people. And that's what we're trying to avoid. Are there so. as many clinical trials for surgery as there are for oncology? No. no. So, not at all. So if you don't have the data... That's the only way you can get the data. Well, so there are more, in surgery, it's, it's much harder to do a clinical trial. Um, but we do a lot of patient series. Um, so we'll do cohort studies um, that are you know, historical cohorts. Um, and I'm sure 
Emily, you'll be in a series. Um, it won't be a very big series, but you will be. Um, and that's, you know, that's how, that's how we get the answer to that question, is that someone will write a paper and say, well, I've done this in six patients, and I know that in these six patients, the disease-free survival was X compared to historical patients with stage four disease. And so we can try to start seeing a benefit or not that way. So that's, that's the difference with surgery is that we tend to just use series of patients. Um, it's, it's a little bit harder to have a prospective trial. I think you had a question. I was actually going to say pretty much what Bonnie did. I was going to say there are clinical trials for chemo and that sort of thing. Why right. aren't there for surgery? Well, and the, the issue is, is that these situations, although a lot of you in this room you know, maybe in this situation, this, like Emily's situation, it's not a common situation. So even if we were to develop a trial, it would take so long to accrue and we would need so many centers that it becomes not feasible. So. Okay, hold on a couple more. Oh. Okay, so the, I think this person is looking for that why not explanation. Um, surgery for stage four, upper right lobe, also um, in lymph nodes on both sides of the neck, 19 months since diagnosis, um, has tried various targeted therapies and some chemo, uh, getting ready to start their fifth chemo. Sort of a, a why not me. So, and I'm happy to look at scans and answer that individually, that it's going to be a very individual um, question. You know, we, I need to know where nodes were and, you know, what response had been, if any response, um, those sort of things. And that's just sort of a, you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of answer. So one of the things um, I wanted to talk about, and it's kind of come up or come into my head um, as we've been talking, if you could maybe explain what um, oligometastatic disease is and how um, that might come to play um, insofar as surgery for a, for a stage four patient. Sure. So um, we've touched a little bit on that. And, you know, again, I think it goes to that whole notion of the local therapy versus systemic therapy. And when we have very few, maybe only two sites of disease, you know, then again, after you've had the systemic treatment, you've had the chemotherapy, and you still only have those two sites of disease, if they're amenable to local therapy, meaning surgery or radiation, then most places would consider that. So I, you know, I'm talking again about maybe brain or chest wall or adrenal. Those tend to be the most common. So what about the patient, and we have a, a lot of patients in the room who are on targeted therapies, right? That is, and they're doing very well on targeted therapies. What about that patient that maybe has bilateral lesions and they're responding really well to their treatment and all of a sudden one little lesion kind of fires back up? Mm -hmm. um, rather than changing treatment, would it make sense maybe to just spot treat, either with radiation or surgery, that one spot that's not responding? You know, I think, again, it not to sound like a broken record, that's going to be one of those um, multidisciplinary decisions um, that's going to be made. And you're going to want to weigh the risks and benefit of the treatment is, you know, the risk of going off chemo to have surgery versus the risk of continuing the chemo versus the risk of changing the regimen, you know, versus the risk of the surgical procedure itself or the radiation itself. Um, most of the time, a spot lesion like that is not going to be treated with a local therapy. Um, but again, you know, that would be something that we talk about in a tumor board type discussion. Can you talk about like 
the complications and risks of surgery, and also, if we're considering surgery, how do we find out about our surgeon or surgeons, how good they are? You know, is the information published from the individual surgeon, the hospital, and all the other parts of that? Okay, so um, let's start with complications of surgery. So biggest complications from having chest surgery are gonna be pneumonia, um, just meaning a, a lung infection, okay? And that has to do with what I mentioned um, before, is that when you have lung surgery, in order to operate on the lung, we actually collapse it, okay? So once we're done with the operation, you as the patient have to breathe well, cough well, and re-expand the area that is left in place. So we don't want you getting a pneumonia after the operation. Other complications are a heart rhythm called atrial fibrillation, which is an arrhythmia of the heart that's basically due to mechanical irritation from the surgery itself. It's usually something that goes away on its own um, with time as the inflammation from surgery subsides. Um, other complications can be the lung taking a long time to heal. So after a thoracic operation, you're gonna have a tube in your chest that drains air and fluid. And some patients will actually need that tube to stay in for a long time um, while their lung heals. But that's an individual decision. So those are common things. Another thing that occurs is what we call post-thoracotomy pain. And that's not an insignificant issue. Luckily, it only occurs in about five to 10% of patients. We don't have a good way to predict who's going to experience post-thoracotomy pain. And that's a, a general term that we use. Um, it can be, so it, even if you don't have a thoracotomy, you can have that pain if, after any type of chest surgery. So those are the main ones um, that everybody should be aware of going into it. And I'm sorry, the second question? Well, the second one is, I want to find out how good you are okay. or oh, that's right. any other yes. surgeon <laughs> plus how good my hospital is at minimizing those complications that you've mentioned. Because I know if I go in the hospital, that's a complication all right there. <laughs> so I've got X percent that I'm going to get have a problem, but I want to reduce it. So how do I find out about it? So um, public reporting is very much on the forefront right now um, in terms of hospital outcomes. And uh, there are various sources for that. Um, NISQIP um, is probably one of the most reliable, and that is um, a national database that uh, tracks hospital outcomes. Surgical outcomes are tracked uh, in that database. And that's where you're gonna find out, you know, hey, in this hospital, you know, the average length of stay for a lobectomy is gonna be this number, and the mortality is gonna be X, and you'll also see where that um, compares nationally. So that's, that's how you can find out. Um, Word of mouth is always a good thing. And you know, ask your surgeon, where did you train? How many of these have you done? Um, you know, some people should be comfortable answering those questions. And who, re <clears throat> and who reports the data? The individual surgeon, the surgical team? Or no, it's usually the, the hospital and um, NISQIP puts out quarterly reports um, that are released to the hospitals, and we actually publish our own data, um, but each individual institution handles that differently. As you can imagine, there are people who want to publish their own data and people who don't. So, <laughs> you know. Um, I may have missed it, but how long does one have to go off, off of chemo before you can perform surgery? It's going to depend on the drug. Oh. Each drug is different. Okay. Like, I know we talked about 
No, it's usually a matter of weeks. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm reading. Uh, okay. <clears throat> So this person wants to rephrase a question. <laughs> um, when his wife was first diagnosed, she was told she was not a, candis a candidate. Tarceva did not work. Um, again, assuming she was EGFR positive, I'm not sure. Uh, stage four, left upper lobe, uh, primary, and pleural space. She's had success with chemo. She's 36 years old. Should they revisit the possibility of surgery with someone? It doesn't hurt to ask. Go ahead. Get it. it doesn't mean the answer is going to be yes, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Do you want to talk to that really quick before we move to the next question? Um, about the answer not always being yes? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah no, we heard um, before I became eligible for surgery, we heard no a lot. Um, and I think it touches on a lot of what Elizabeth has been saying and in terms of you have to find the doctor who's right for you and it has to be looked at a million different ways by many different people. Um, some surgeons are gonna be more likely to say no, some may be more likely to say yes. I think it's always worth asking the question and going to as many people as you can and getting second, third, fifth, tenth opinions if you can if you can swing that, because, you know, I had surgery, but I was also told no by many, many, many people before I heard yes. Um, you also are maybe going to hear yes at a, a, sta a different stage than you heard no. So you may hear no, 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 uh, but keep up with those doctors. Continue sending them their slides. Continue sending them your scans and your reports, because for me, there became a point where chemotherapy stopped shrinking my tumor and it became stable. And that was the point at which my surgeon said, yes, now surgery is an option. So had we not kept up and had we not continued to send my scans, continue to send my reports, he may not have caught that at that time. So, you know, there's always, there, there's, no, sorry. There's not always a window, but you know, you, it bears repeating that you need to continue to keep up with your scans, keep up with your doctors, continue sending your reports out because there may be a time and you may be a window, even if you're stage four. So it's, it's not a yes for everyone, but I think it's very important to, to keep trying and to keep asking because you are your own best advocate and you are the person that's going to keep pushing for that every single time, so. The ask you how it felt with everybody telling you no and you find one doctor that says yes. Oh, how can does I, that? Can I just in, inject one thing? Yeah. Um, I, I agree with everything you said. I just want to iterate one thing that you didn't really say, but I think you did, is that you were being treated while you were getting these opinions. You don't want to seek opinions over and over and over again at the expense of treatment mm -hmm. because you will have disease progression while you are doing that and that that's not what you want so it is very important to maintain treatment <coughs> while seeking additional opinions i'm sorry no well i interrupted i'm sorry <laughs> but I can't help but wonder how it feels when you have one doctor that says yes with all of these that have said no. And I'm thrilled for how everything's come out for you. But what did you go through just finding one person that would say yes? Um, I, I remember my husband hearing it on the phone and running through the house screaming. <laughs> so it, it kind of feels like that, you know. Um, there's still, I mean, it's not like it's an easy decision. Even though you hear yes, then you have to think about, well, okay, now I understand why all these doctors are, and these surgeons are talking about quality of life. And so many surgeons don't want to do surgery because they don't want to affect your quality of life after surgery. And they know that your quality of life might be less after surgery with one lung. But once you get past that initial thing, it's just elation. I mean, I was ex very excited to have someone say yes, because that was what I wanted the entire time. I was to just get it out of me. I think we all <laughs> understand that feeling. Um, 
so to hear somebody, you know, kind of backing me up on that, it was a wonderful feeling. But, you know, every case is different and every patient is different. So, you know, I want more people to hear that, that yes. But I think as Elizabeth is saying, it's just, there's so many individual things that need to be looked at by so many different doctors. And, and hopefully we'll get to a point where more people are hearing yes. And that's, that's what I'm here for, you know, is to, is to, you know, hopefully hear that from more people than just me. I think, um, oh, yes, there we go. My question is, um, can you hear me in this? But I don't think it's on. Yeah, I can Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I wonder if anyone else, uh, you know how when you're first diagnosed, you're a deer in headlights? Because you have no idea what anything means. So I don't want to personalize this, but my experience was that I was shown a flow chart of what my two options were, what the standard of care was, and then what the fork to the right would be. I had a telephone appointment with the thoracic surgeon who said that my quality of life would be extremely impacted, but that surgery was recommended as a standard of care. And I've always been active physically and mentally, and I don't have a partner to help me through recovery. So I asked the question, why do I have to decide the same week as my diagnosis? Can I not try localized therapies and then we could reevaluate and make the decision? And I was told that they absolutely would not ever do surgery or consider surgery after radiation. So um, I am not a big believer in hard and fast yeses and absolutes. Um, you know, I, there's an art to practicing medicine. And um, it, without looking at your scans, it's, it's difficult. There may be reasons that they told you that, depending on and anatomically where your tumor is and that and again that's going to have to do with healing because radiated tissue doesn't heal very well mm -hmm. so if there is a worry with you know what would be needed to be resected um, and then put back together uh, healing after you've had radiation then that would be a, a concern but there are things that we can do to help that healing after radiation um, so, you know, I would, I would say you might want to seek a, seek second, a second opinion. second opinion after my first course is, is completed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just to be clear, you chose not to have surgery and you chose to have the, the chemotherapy That's and radiation? Chemotherapy and okay. concurrent radiation, okay. correct. Okay. And just, just so you know, I'm a 10-year lung cancer survivor. I had radiation and chemotherapy before surgery. Oh, and then I had surgery. That's so, I know. So, that's very interesting. Thank yeah. you so much. And I was stage 3B. Okay. And you don't need another. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have a mic. Yeah. Feels better, though. Um, I know, right? We can always trade <laughs> yeah. ne next month. Um, oh, go ahead. Were you? Oh, sorry, Mark. Um, so I have a stage 2B patient. Um, who had a clear brain MRI at the time of diagnosis, adenocarcinoma. Um, do you have thoughts or opinions on follow-up MRIs after uh, initial diagnosis? So um, follow-up MRI is not currently standard of care. Um, the current NCCN guidelines for surveillance include imaging, depending on the source, every three to six months for the first two years, and then followed by, again, six months to annual, depending on the source that you look at, for a total of five years, and that's imaging of your chest. Um, routine surveillance, and we're talking about for NED patients, just routine screening surveillance. Um, for individual lesions that are being followed, that's gonna be different, because that's you're gonna measure stability versus progression. Anybody else before I jump back in? 
Dr. David, is it ever appropriate to remove a diseased lung and replace it with a good one? Um, for a diseased lung from cancer? Unfortunately, no. Because the, um, the immune suppression that's required for the transplanted lung would actually magnify the behavior of the tumor substantially. And isn't it true that if the, the cancer was already in your bloodstream mm -hmm. and had metastasized to certain parts of the body, it could very easily turn around and go back into the new lung? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. David, I see that you're uh, active in robotic surgery. And I think, you know, to the uh, observer of the, of the lung being a very dynamic uh, mass that's you know you know breathing going in and out, and and then robotics you know would have to be driven with very very creative software that could follow the movement of the lung, but maybe the surgery is uh, doesn't uh, uh, get confused with all that movement. But could you give a little layman's approach to what what robotic surgery has brought to lung? Sure. Uh, so the surgical robot is purely a tool for the surgeon to use. It's not like R2-D2 is in the room operating independently. I am in control of everything that the robot is, is doing. So what the robot actually entails is a large machine that has a camera that you can attach to it, and it has, depending on the system, it has multiple arms. Each arm and the camera are then docked to the patient, meaning that as the patient, you will have a, an instrument going through your chest wall between your ribs. And that is what connects the robot to the patient. And then the surgeon is in control of every aspect of it. The surgeon controls all of the instrument arms and the video camera. And then it becomes just like any other surgery. And so the camera um, has a very good uh, visualization. It actually gives you a 3D view. So the visualization is actually a little bit better. And when we compare the robot to VATS instruments, the robotic arms actually have a wrist that moves inside of the patient, whereas a typical VATS instrument is just a straight stick that moves up and down or you know, in whichever direction you're moving. But it doesn't have that wristed uh, element to it. So it, it really is um, just a tool for the surgeon. Um, but again, that's something that you, know, you wanna make sure that your surgeon has gone through appropriate training um, because it is a new, a new technology that we have and everyone is still learning. And so people are going to have varying levels of experience with it. So it's, and it's, it's not for every case. You know, I think if you're, if you're a, a later stage patient, you want to worry less about the technical aspects of your surgery in terms of VATS versus open versus the robot. You know, you want to do surgery or no surgery. And if you're in the surgery category, you want to trust your surgeon to do the technical operation that you need. How many robotic, sur How many robotic assisted surgeries have you done personally as, as a frame reference? So I am still in my learning curve, and I've done about 50. 50? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Why are some of the older surgeons so not wanting to get involved with the robotic surgery. Do you, I've heard a couple of them say they like hands-on, they like to get in there and use their own hands. And Ooh. I would think this robotic surgery would be so wonderful. And I met people, I got to be a part of a, a little, not a study, but a thing that I spent two days there. And I was the only one that hadn't had robotic surgery in the group, and they were all from little small towns all over the United States. Here I was from the Bay Area where we've got all the best and the newest and everything. And, and did you have a VATS lobe? No, 
Okay. I, I thought I was going to have VATS. He said he wouldn't know till he started in. Okay. And then I wasn't able to have the VATS. And that's always the case. So any time, and, and I have this discussion with, with any patient, is that when we are planning to do a minimally invasive surgery or a surgery with small incisions, it's always the possibility that you're going to need the big incision surgery. And that's dependent on you know, your anatomy, factors with your tumor. The last thing you want is someone to do an operation with small incisions, but not give you the best cancer operation that you can have. So that's that's one thing to consider. And then um, in terms of robotics and why more people aren't um, aren't taking it on, there's a little bit of, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks mm -hmm. is, is a challenge. Um, there are some surgeons, you know, who just don't believe in it. Um, there, there is some good data to, to suggest that the robot actually makes it a little bit easier for surgeons who only do open surgery um, to do small incision surgery because of that wristed element that I brought up. Um, because it is actually, once you master the technical nuances of the robot, it is actually a little bit easier. You can do more advanced things with the robot than you can just with the straight sticks by VATS. Um, but there is a substantial learning curve. And we're talking hours and hours of simulation, you know, going to watch other surgeons doing it, going to courses. It's a big investment, and not all surgeons are, are willing to put that time in. And, and if you're in a really busy practice, you don't have that time. So there are a lot of factors that go into whether or not people adapt it. The recovery process is so different. Uh, that, to me, is the beauty of Well, that. so the recovery is potentially a little bit shorter, but we don't have, again, we don't have our big series yet to really suggest that. And I think what we're going to find is that the, the robotic cases, maybe you spend a day shorter in the hospital than a VATS, maybe. Um, and in terms of there may be a little bit less pain. But again, those are preliminary studies, and we don't have the final word yet. And it'll probably take us several years to get it. So, um, so how are we going to get data on whether stage surgery is effective for stage four patients if most stage four patients are told no surgery. I mean, we pursued it based on studies in Japan where they seem to be more aggressive with stage four patients. And the stats were encouraging. And, and, and that's why we said we are, we're going to seek this for curative intent for stage four. Sorry, Elizabeth, before you answer that, I want to just kind of piggyback on what you said, Michelle, because, and um, talk a little bit about, or just for a second about your surgery, because back, you know, 10, almost 11 years ago when you had your surgery, uh, nobody was doing it, right? And then we were talking earlier and you were saying there's all kinds of case studies of that it's, it's 10 years later, but it's being routinely done now, right? So how do you get from there to there faster? So, you know, I don't know that there's a faster, but you, you get there from, again, the case series. So, you know, we take the four or five patients like Emily, we write them up, and then somebody else says, oh, well, I have four or five patients. And, you know, that gets written up and then somebody says, OK, we need to look at our national database, which we have for thoracic surgery. And we need to look at the young patients and see how they do and look at stage four. There won't be any stage four patients in that database because we aren't doing it. But we'll use those series um, to then say, OK, based on these series, that's enough data to then probably create a cooperative group trial. And so then we use one of our cooperative groups, meaning a group of centers that work together. Because I mentioned the whole issue is that 
there are so few of these patients who could be considered that you would need a lot of centers working together to get a big enough number of patients to make a meaningful study that would but, be powered statistically. Yes. And to that point, though, you know, just as in oncology, you know, there are associations like the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer and the Lung Cancer Congress and Thoracic Surgeons Associations. They go, they attend meetings and share mm -hmm. and present patient studies and patient cases and, you know, it, it gets spread out that so way as well. So I, I have a question and, and it's, it, I'd like to know what your opinion is on, we're doing a lot of work um, now in pushing out information into the community setting, right? Where most patients are being seen. Mm -hmm. How can, in your opinion, a foundation like ours who is in such constant contact with real life patients all around the world, maybe help um, to push some of this anecdotal data to where it needs to be, particularly from the community setting, mm -hmm. um, where maybe they're not, they're not in these cooperative groups, they're not participating in this space. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, probably something like this, like what we're talking about, you know, curative <coughs> intense surgery for stage four, um, is probably not something that right now in this country should be done in the community setting. You know, it's something that should be done in an academic center. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's one issue. And, um, you know, the other in issue that we all face is insurance. And, you know, I don't know, Emily, if that was an issue for you, um, but it's, you know, we say seek a second opinion, but, you know, everybody is tied to what your insurance will pay for unless you, you know, can fund things independently. And that's not an insignificant issue um, that we all have to deal with. And insurance so. usually only pays for what is in, in the standard NCCN care, guidelines yes. and what's standard of care. Well, and it so. becomes even harder when you're in a situation like, like say, a, a Kaiser-type system or, a, you know, a specific... HMO or health Captain network, system. right? Where you can't go outside, outside of that system to get or your second you opinion. Or if you do, it, it takes, a, you know, moving a mountain yeah. to get outside. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hmm. Okay, um, there's a couple of other things that I wanted to touch on. It came up earlier and we didn't really go into it um, much further, but when talking about um, symptom management, um, can we talk a little bit about um, what that looks like, whether it's, um, well, first of all, maybe talk about an infusion and what some of the treatment yeah. options are for those. Yeah, so how many folks have had a pleural effusion? Um, Fluid in your chest from the tumor. Only Emily? Yeah, okay. So it's, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon issue with lung cancer. Um, and it can cause some pretty significant symptoms depending on the severity. Um, and symptoms are going to be either shortness of breath or cough. Um, so, you know, fluid in the chest may or may not have tumor cells in it. Uh, it may or may not completely compress your lung. So it's going to be managed in different ways. Um, for patients who have a lot of lung compression, meaning that the lung is not fully expanded, so there's a lot of fluid in the chest and not a lot of good functioning lung tissue, those patients might need something called a pleurex catheter, which is a catheter, meaning a drain that's placed into the chest that actually stays in. And it's something that you can have at home and you'll be set up with little containers to drain the fluid yourself at home. And you can drain it as you need, or um, you may eventually work your way back to a system where you drain it just on a schedule. So that's, that's one option, and that's typically something that is placed in an outpatient setting, meaning it's a procedure, you come to the hospital, you have the procedure, and you go home from the procedure. Um, another option for patients who have fluid but have 
a lot of their lungs still expanded would be what we call a pleurodesis procedure, meaning that either through surgery or through a tube itself, medicine is actually put into the chest to cause inflammation. And the goal of that is to cause the lung to stick fully to the chest wall so that there is no room for fluid to accumulate between the lung and the chest wall. And that's something that, again, is either done with a VAT surgery or maybe done just through a tube, depending on the situation. Um, so those are, are pretty common procedures that we'll be involved in for um, patients with advanced stage disease. And um, the same thing, fluid can also develop around the heart, um, which may need to be drained. And usually we'll start with a simple drain that a cardiologist will place to drain the fluid. Um, but occasionally it'll need to be converted over to what we call a surgical window, meaning we create a hole in your heart sac that drains the fluid either into your belly or into your chest, depending on the situation. So, you know, those are are some common procedures that may occur in sort of the later stages of disease. What causes the fluid to build up in those places? Um, it's, it's some of the tumor biology. Again, not all of the fluid has tumor cells in it per se, but it's all of the body's reaction to tumor. And it's just, you know, like inflammation in a joint. If you bang your knee on something, you know, and it swells, it's, it's that whole same kind of notion. Inflammation. I thought you were raising your hand. You're not raising your hand. Yeah, you. <laughs> oh. Okay. Um, you, you can see by this room that there is a room full of very empowered um, and educated patients online and, and both yes. in this room. And we're very proud of that. Um, so you talked a lot about the multidisciplinary approach, and, and I know Danielle talked to you about our Centers of Excellence program. Um, how do we encourage physicians to include vetted, of course, advocacy groups as part of that multidisciplinary approach? So not only is the physicians and the pathologists and the thoracic surgeons and the clinicians involved, but so is the advocacy group who can help. As you see, we do every day navigate a patient's journey and help them with that first day and that first week when they're thrown with so much information. So what advice could you give us and as a room full of patients to ensure that they're an advocacy group like the Adaria Lung Cancer Foundation as part of their multidisciplinary approach? I think that um, you guys you know, need to advocate for yourselves. As much as you advocate for your patients, um, you know, you, you do a great job advocating for the patients and educating the patients, but the physicians need some education too. <laughs> you know, um, not, not a lot of ph physicians may not be aware, they may not be open-minded to it, um, they may not recognize what a valuable resource it is. Um, there is a big push um, in all types of cancer surgery to develop what we call survivorship programs, um, meaning programs that prepare patients for living with lung cancer, living with having a scan every three months. Um, and that is a real opportunity for organizations like yours to you know, get involved in that aspect of it because there's, there's a lot, as I'm sure you can testify to, you know, that goes into that visit every three months um, in terms of the anxiety before it, during it, after it, that is probably not addressed by the physician you're seeing. And, um, you know, I think that's a great resource for an organization like this to help with. Um, and then in terms of, you know, getting involved in the multidisciplinary discussions, um, you know, there are some issues with patient confidentiality and privacy um, that w would have to be overcome. But, um, you know, I think that would be something that could be addressed on an individual um, institutional, you know, uh, level. Um, but I think the, the biggest thing is advocacy. 
and you know, making physicians aware of how these patient-centered organizations really make a huge difference for patients. Thank you. Yeah, just to, to add to that, one of the things I've done is I've started bringing brochures with me every time I see my doctor, leaving them, and now that I work with the foundation, I leave my card. So, you know, I think for me, it was going back to my doctor and saying, this is what really helped me through. You guys are great, thanks, but you know, this also helped me through. Please let other patients know about about this foundation because you know that's I think that's just sometimes just as important as the actual you know treatment that you're getting yeah and we do that too in our after you when you come for your post-operative visit where we go over your pathology when you walk out the door you know we give you a packet that says we'll be scanning you you know every so often for the next five years and here's more information about lung cancer and one of the things we give is a a brochure about the foundation. Yeah. So that's, you know, it's it's a frontline thing. And I think, you know, for, for a long time, and this goes back years, advocacy, advocacy groups were thought of um, as kind of, you know, really annoying people that are out on the Capitol steps, you know, carrying signs, yeah, yeah. kind of like the people you see outside prisons before they're executing someone. <laughs> You know, and, uh, you know, we've come a long, long way where, you know, we're, we're way past that. I, you know, I, I can speak for ourselves and, and others out there. We're on advisory boards for pharmaceutical companies. We're, we're up there in a, in a big way, you know, bringing your stories and what you need to not only pharmaceuticals, but major institutions and, and things like that, too. So. And you're... You know, you are backing yourself up your, and your contribution up with not only the social science contribution, but you're contributing to basic science. Right. And, um, you know, I think that's a really admirable um, part of the foundation. Yeah. And it, it gives you a lot of credibility. Right. And we're, we're a big help in trial accrual. You know, letting patients know where those clinical trials are for them, guiding them to that those places, and all, and when we measure it all, we have metrics on, you know, what our performance is and what we're bringing to the table, and it's it's actually becoming quite the thing now to have a patient at the table. I always say that there should be a patient at every table where there are decisions being made about their treatment. Um, it's the beginning and the end of the whole process. Mm -hmm. So it's happening. It's mm -hmm. really happening now in a big way to the point where we're so busy we can't do all the things mm -hmm. they're asking us to do. Mm -hmm. um, before we get back to the ALCF commercial that we've been, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we've been giving for the last couple of minutes, right. I have another um, question online. Um, do you know what has a better statistical outcomes for overall survival, um, SBRT or uh, uh, surgical? Resection. So the survival outcomes are better with surgery, but you can't just, it's not a black and white comparison, again, because the patients who end up having radiation as a primary treatment tend to be a little sicker, um, and it's not an even playing field at all. So um, it, the answer is surgery, but it's, it's not a fair answer. The second radiation question. I'm wondering if somebody online is from Accuray or Varian or no, it's a patient. Okay, <laughs> just curious. <laughs> um, does anybody else have any other questions? I just want to make sure I haven't forgotten anything. I have I a question. I have. Yeah. Where do you see surgery in, you know, you know our goal is chronically managed lung cancer by 2023, and we're really starting to believe that could happen with everything that's going on outside in, in the field, so to speak, and surgery is gonna be, be a big part of that. So what is your take on surgery being part of the chronically managed lung cancer? I would love it. Yeah. I would love to be able to do more operations for lung cancer. And, you know, I think the ways we get there, we get there through screening. We find lung cancer when it is more treatable. And that that is the big thing. And, um, you know, with the advances that are going on um, in terms of the medical oncology developments, 
they're they're awesome and you know what's gone on just in the past five years has been incredible you know there are it's estimated there are about 400,000 people in the US living with lung cancer living with lung cancer so and people never quoted that statistic statistic in the past you know lung cancer was not you know was previously a death sentence and now people are surviving and living with lung cancer and that is going to keep changing and it's going to keep getting better and you know we need we again need to be better about finding it early and our, and the rest of it our chemo is going to keep getting better and as we can get more and more disease control and prolong disease control then we may see you know additional indications for surgery in the future. The other metric I don't think people are looking at is, you know, for the longest time since I've been involved in this, it's always the five-year survival rate. Um, and that's starting to tick up now, but the really important number is between one and five years. You know, 10 years ago, people were barely getting past the one year. Right. And now we're getting to the point where people are surviving five years, creeping into six years. So we're, right. there are a lot of really positive things happening out there. Really positive things. Mm -hmm. um, I swear I read something in the paper maybe four months ago that uh, just recently the FDA or the AMA or somebody came out and said, finally, if you've got, if, to the doctors, if you, have a, if you have a patient who has a chronic cough or who has a history of smoking or even, you know, or used to smoke or whatever, um, give them a CAT scan, don't rely on the x-ray. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a big deal. It's I would huge. have discovered my cancer deal. a year yeah. earlier. That's a really, I, I was Thank clear. I, Six months ago, a year ago, on a, with an with an X-ray, and it's really just common sense because a CT is a 360 degree look at your chest, and an X-ray is just looking what's in the front. But, so much can hide behind your ribs and your heart. And, but they didn't know. And I mean, they right. didn't do it, right? No. Is that is that correct that that came out recently? Yes, yes. That's the. In essence, you're talking about the National Lung Screening Trial. And that's where we know that you know a low dose CT scan in high risk patients can actually lower lung cancer mortality. Yes. So an interesting conversation that we will not be able to to finish um, because of time constraints, but just kind of food for thought is, you know, yes, NLST did prove that, and then shortly thereafter, Medicare said, well, we don't really care what NLST said, at least not Yet. right now, because we're not going, yeah, not right now, because we're not going to cover it. So what, what role do you see physicians, patients, caregivers, nonprofits like ours playing in helping so, with that? You know, there's a lot of advocacy right now on the physician side. Um, I will admit, I don't, I don't know on the foundation side, on the advocate groups, you know, what the activity level is, but this is something that, you know, thoracic surgeons, pulmonologists, medical oncologists, um, people who take care of lung cancer are passionate about this and are pushing for it because we want to see a stage shift, meaning we want that. We want to see more patients having early stage disease. And, you know, the breast cancer advocates should be applauded. I mean, they have done a great job. They've, you know, got the whole country turning pink in October. We need that for lung cancer. So that, you know, should be the goal. And, and we need to get there. We need to get there through a united front. Um. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. David? Thank you. <laughs> Danielle? Yes. I just want to add, um, for the first time I was here, I think it seems to be quite a bit of them. Uh, you really are the touch point within Bonnie Adero Foundation. When people, you know, what do you hear about this doctor? What do you hear about this treatment? Things like that. People always come to you because you're in total touch with the community, like Dr. David, Dr. Gandera, from, you know, and all the other people. So, uh, Daniel is great for just offering tips, if you will, of things to avoid, things to, to, to try to do. So 
uh, for the first timers uh, look at Daniel as being the touchstone for uh, information that is so critical. When someone said deer in the headlights uh, response at first, well, <laughs> Daniel gets you defocused off the, the headlights and thinking how to be an advocate. So, I think we made a couple of really good points that I just want to reiterate. You know, tell your physicians about organizations like this. Bring a friend to this meeting next month. And, um, you know, keep asking. If you have questions, keep asking until you understand. Good, good, good. Um, so if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to do some housekeeping. Um, um, our 5K, does anybody know when it is? <laughs> it's a week from uh, this Sunday. Um, thank you all for all those of you who have created your teams and signed up and are ready to go out and rock it in San Francisco. It's Oh, it is this Sunday. Did I say a week from Sunday? Yeah. God, that would put me back in Boston. No. Sorry. Yeah, this Sunday. Um, um, thank you all for everything um, that you've done. Uh, uh, for that event. It promises to be an amazing day. If you have not signed up yet, it is not too late. Um, we have typically about, and correct me if I'm wrong, 2,000, 2,000? 20, 2,000 to 2,000. Yeah, roughly about 2,000 people come out for lung cancer. That is a huge thing for lung cancer, getting 2,000 people together in one place at the same time for this disease is, a, is an absolute... Um, incredible thing to see. So if you, if you can make it out, um, um, there's some information over on the, on the piano. For those of you that are watching online, our next event after that, and I have to write it down because I'm not the event team, unless Andrea wants it, October 5th in Philly. Um, so if you're out in the Philadelphia area, um, come out and see us there. Also an amazing ev event, and it happens to be Mr. Adario of Adario Lung Cancer Foundation's hometown. So we got a lot of really fun people coming out. Um, Lots of Italians Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, for that <laughs> event. And then um, November 8th, of course, is our, our gala in San Francisco. So if anybody wants any information about um, any of those events, you can, um, anybody in the room, you can talk to Andrea or Jenny about it. Um, and anybody online, you can email us and, and get some more information. Um, thank you. What? Oh, oh, yes, if you don't have a team and you, you don't want to start your own, I have my own. It's called Bonnie's Heroes. We're a little behind in our goals. <laughs> so any of you out there in cyberspace, if you want to join and run with us virtually or donate, sign on. <laughs> I actually have a girlfriend in Colorado who is going to visit her daughter at college, and she's, they're going to be there the day of the run, so they're going to they're going to run in Colorado at, at start time for us, and they've, they've got their little team set up out there, so they're excited. Cool. So it can be done. It can be done. Um, thank you, um, um, obviously, to all of our generous supporters without um, whom we could not do any of this. Uh, Merck, Genentech, Lily, Novartis, BMS, Celgene, and Clovis specifically for sponsoring this, um, this evening um, over and over. Um, to... Uh, um, the office bar and grill for consistently providing food for pasta night. Um, it's now pasta night. It's just yeah. pasta night. Right. It's, it's just, just pasta yeah, night. it's pasta night. Um, yeah, they have plenty of other things at the office bar and grill. And then, as always, thank, a huge thank you to Peninsula Television for um, uh, cons consistently supporting us and what we're doing for coming in here every month, setting all this stuff up, um, filming not only this but live streaming. Um, uh, from the back room. Um, I want to thank... Oh, Covidian was in the room and they left. Yeah. Covidian just, um, just uh, sponsored our Center of Excellence program, which, as you guys know, is a, a huge part of um, our outreach out in the community setting where we're trying to help some of these community hospitals, again, where most of the patients are seen, create these um, uh, lung cancer pathways and centers of excellence, um, starting with screening, moving through... Uh, diagnosis, treatment, and hopefully survivorship. So a huge thank you to Covidian for that. Um, there, I, I did. 
They're making me notes. I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's like I've got, what, is, what was that old show where somebody was in the, anyway. Um, um, thank you also to Myriad for coming out um, and sitting in with us tonight. And um, I said Clovis. Okay. She kept saying to me. <laughs> but, but most importantly, the patients. Yes. And that's where I was just going. Yeah. Here yeah. and who we who we do it for, and we look at this this. Um, Danny and I were just on a call with um, um, with another group today, and we were t we happened to be talking about the living room, and you know, looking at some of you who have been here since we started it, and what it was, and and what it is now. Um, it's all because of you guys, and we are consistently striving to give you guys what it is you're asking for and what you're needing. So don't hesitate to inundate my inbox if you think we could be doing a better job um, in this space. Um, do you have a question? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to thank. She's, she's my last thank you. And she's going to get a round of applause, too. <laughs> there are many things I'm going to forget. Maybe it's because I'm just rambling and rambling and rambling. There's a lot to talk about. Um, and last but absolutely not least, a huge thank you to Dr. Elizabeth David from UC Davis for coming down. Um, and I think enlightening us, you know, we've had surgeons here in the past, and sometimes I think it's a little whoosh, whoosh, like, you know, um, high level. And for really bringing it down into a space that was, I think, and I hope, easy for all of you to understand. Um, if there's any questions that come up after the fact, um, please let me know, and I can always get them over to Dr. David um, and hopefully get answers for you. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes. Who's going to be here next month? Oh, yes. Sorry. So next month, October, Michelle, October, I don't even know the date of my own next living room, 21st, um, um, Dr. David Carbone um, from OSU is coming out. And he's coming out to talk about something that um, Dr. David also touched on tonight, um, the science versus the art of treating lung cancer. Because there is definitely a science and stuff that you learn in books, and then there's every, uh, uh, there's the art, which is the thing you learn in actually working with the patients day in and day out. So he's coming out from Ohio, or actually he's coming in from Australia, stopping here on his way back to Ohio um, um, to talk to all of you. So it's going to be a great night. Um, and I hope to see you all here and all of you online. Um, for those of you who might want to stay, uh, my mom and I have both been challenged in the, the Whip It Challenge. Um, I was challenged uh, a, a few weeks ago, Tina, I hope you're on, um, by a friend of uh, the foundation that we met a long time ago out in Atlanta, whose daughter Abby is 16 and has been living with stage four lung cancer for several years now. Uh, Tina challenged me. And you were recently challenged um, as well. So we are doing, uh, taking pies in the face tonight, whipped cream pies, um, yeah. and challenging yeah. others. So anybody, yeah. Tina's like, yeah, I want to see it. Right. right? <laughs> um, so anybody who wants to stay um, and watch the pie in the face challenge. We're going to do it offline. Please, please feel free. Um, yeah, it's right in the face. I think I get to do her. She gets to do me. I don't know. Be my kind of my challenger is Dusty Donaldson. While we're online, you know, I'm doing it. You'll see it on Facebook tomorrow. Dusty has a, has a foundation um, out um, on the other side of the country, and she focuses a lot on radon and helping to get awareness out there, especially in sort of those belts where the, the radon um, levels are really, really high and Today's make sure that... Today's birthday, too. Today's Dusty's birthday? Happy birthday, Dusty. Really? Unless Sally's wrong. Okay, Did you? okay. Well, oh. good to know. Good oh. to know when we upload this tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, stay tuned and be sure to sign into Facebook tomorrow um, so that you can uh, see the great videos of the, the Whip It Challenge and see who might actually be challenged by us. I don't know. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to challenge three people. I have a feeling there's going to be a few more than three people. I'm going to so. challenge Andrea Ferris at Longevity. Perfect. I Online, I Andrea, you're challenged. Yeah, nice. Whipped cream in the face. Um, okay, so do you have anything else? No. No? No. We talked about I don't. Okay. No, life is good. But, you know, just be positive there. You know, I, well, I was diagnosed 10 years ago, and... This is a whole new world. It's a whole new world for lung cancer. And, you know, if you have to have it, you know, better now than 10 years ago or five years ago. Yep. Yep. 
All right, thank you, everybody. Two years ago. Thank you.